Hey guys, welcome back to our complete guide to sim racing video series. So in the previous video, we took a broader look at some of the fundamental things that you need to understand before spending a cent on sim racing hardware. So if you haven't already, I would definitely recommend checking that video out before you dive into this one. Link it above my head for you right now. But in today's video, we'll begin our more detailed look at some of the individual components that make up a sim rig. So today we'll be starting with the most important component, the pedals. And as with the previous video, the aim here isn't to try and steer you towards any particular product but rather to arm you with the right knowledge so that you can apply it during your own product research and make sure that you're asking the right sorts of questions now it's important to understand that regardless of how much money you spend as of the time of making this video no set of sim racing pedals is absolutely perfect that's to say that no set of pedals that are currently on the market, at least the consumer market, are really able to reproduce the feeling of, you know, things like pedal shutter with the ABS activating, the textured feeling of the pads interfacing with a spinning rotor. Although I have seen some people go as far as actually hook up their pedals to a caliper and brake rotor, you know, just to sort of try to give that sort of feeling of fluid moving throughout the system. You know, so there's all sorts of things that you can do, but other things that you can't really do at the moment are things like, you know, the effect of brake fade due to, you know, change in the fluid viscosity relative to temperature you know all those sorts of things that happen in a real life race car or street car but are really difficult to simulate in a simulator now there are some pretty fancy tricks that manufacturers play such as vibration motors on the pedals hydraulic dampeners you know things like that which can certainly provide some valuable feedback but none of them are absolutely perfect and none of them really reproduce exactly what you feel in a real car so much like what we discussed in the previous video with regards to g-force your brain has to rely on other cues such as what's happening on the screen Screen, as well as force feedback through the wheel to establish the muscle memory that's necessary to sort of find the threshold of braking pressure before locking up. There is a flip side to this, however, and that's because generally speaking, a lot of the variables that exist in real life that impact how a car's braking capacity might vary around a racetrack, such as, you know, different types of road surfaces, oil spills, chassis and firewall flex, all those sorts of things don't tend to have as big of an impact in the sim world as they do in the real world. But this does compensate to an extent, but different sims handle these sorts of variables differently of course but again generally speaking i do tend to find that braking consistency is a little bit easier to achieve in the sim world than it is in the real world simply because there's less variables at play over time though the gap is starting to close and we saw a big step forward with the set of corso competizione recently for example with the implementation of chassis flex now admittedly i thought that was a bit of a wank when i heard about it but when i tried it you definitely can feel the impact that it has on the overall driving experience. And you can expect that things will continue to improve in that sense as sims become more and more advanced. Now there's three main types of pedals available on the market, potentiometer based, Hall effect sensor based and load cell based. With the biggest difference between an expensive set and a cheap set of pedals besides build quality being the overall feel and response of the brake in particular. Hence why the majority of this video will be focused around braking feel. Some pedals such as the HE Ultimate pedals that I use for example feature a load cell for all three pedals but more typically you'll find cheaper pedals will use a potentiometer for all three pedals whereas more expensive ones will use either potentiometers or Hall effect sensors for the throttle and clutch and a load cell for the brake. So What's the difference and which is better? Unfortunately, you do get what you pay for when it comes to these things. A potentiometer is essentially just a position sensor. It uses a variable resistance to measure the position of the pedal. And this is interpreted by the game as braking force. While manufacturers are getting increasingly more tricky with the types of springs and dampers that they use to make the pedals feel more realistic, the bottom line is that in the real world, brake pressure in a car is relative to the amount of pressure that you're physically putting on the pedal, not the brake pedal's position. As potentiometers require on a mechanically moving dial, this also introduces the opportunity for complete or intermittent failure, as well as variations in sensitivity over time as dust, debris, and dead skin cells inevitably find their way in. Now, now, Hall effect sensors essentially achieve the same result as a potentiometer, but they work by measuring the distance between a magnet and the sensor itself, which is then converted into an electrical signal and interpreted by the game as braking force. While again, this is measuring the physical position of the pedal rather than brake pressure, it does have the significant advantage of not relying on mechanically moving parts, which greatly reduces the opportunity for failure. A load cell, however, is fundamentally different in how it operates. It uses a transducer to convert physical load or pressure into an electrical signal 
signal which can be interpreted by the game as braking force in much the same way as braking force is applied to a pedal in a real car and boosted through the hydraulic booster system then applied to the brake pads. So all other things being equal, a load cell brake pedal is going to do a better job at producing a more lifelike braking performance in terms of how the force is relayed into the sim. But don't be fooled into thinking that just because a set of pedals has a load cell, it automatically means they're going to feel great. Load cell has become a bit of a marketing buzzword in recent times. And just throwing a load cell into an otherwise entry level pedal set isn't going to magically transform them. And in actual fact, putting a load cell into a cheap set of pedals would more than likely make them feel worse due to the lack of mechanical resistance fighting against you. One important thing to understand is that load cells do have a physical limit in terms of their measurement range. And you'll usually see this advertised as a weight such as 90 kilograms, for example. This means that the sensor will be maxed out at a pressure of 90 kilos or 90 kilograms of force applied. And pushing beyond that limit won't result in harder braking. So you can imagine if you're using a set of pedals that has a 90 kilogram load cell, for example, but you don't skip leg day and you're routinely pushing 150 kilos plus of force through your pedals, the pedals are gonna operate more like an on off switch unless you learn to have a little bit more finesse in your braking. Sensitivity is also important for other reasons, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. The brake pedal in a real car generates a progressive amount of resistance against your foot as you push it down. The harder you want to brake, the more force you have to apply. And this is perhaps where most people will feel the biggest difference between pedal sets. Cheaper pedals tend to have a more consistent feel throughout the majority of the pedal stroke. And they only really stiffen up right at the very end of the range of travel when you reach the bump stop, which as you can probably guess makes it a lot more difficult to establish muscle memory. Essentially, you're having to teach your brain to move your ankle to a certain position to apply maximum braking force without locking up rather than applying a certain amount of force. Now, because physical force provides a physical point of reference, it's much easier to train your brain this way. Hence why just about every single experienced sim racer will tell you that a better quality set of pedals are the single largest contributing factor to faster and more consistent lap times. I've done a few videos demonstrating this myself with various different pedals and I'll link below in the description for you guys to check those out as well. Load cells, potentiometers and hall effect sensors aside, higher end pedals will generally provide a more progressive feel just like in a real car and they do this with either metal foam or elastomer springs or a combination of different types with different compression ratings as you begin to push the pedal down the most lightly rated spring will begin to compress first and as you push harder the next spring will compress and so forth until maximum force is applied most mid to high end tier pedals offer a significant amount of physical adjustability as well which means you're able to dial in the braking to your personal preference based on your physical strength and of course the style of cars that you're driving Formula style cars, for example, tend to have a shorter pedal stroke. Based on my personal experience though, I tend to recommend finding a physical setting as a middle ground that suits your driving style generally, and then making fine tuning adjustments to suit different types of cars or different sims within the software or the sim itself. So the threshold for braking is as consistent as possible across the board. That way you reduce the amount of retraining that you'll have to do to establish muscle memory when switching between different cars. So most mid to high end pedals will either include, or as with the Fnatic Club Sport V3 pedals have the option of an upgrade kit to add a hydraulic dampener as well. Now these do a pretty good job of simulating the weight of a real brake pedal due to the hydraulic resistance present as you force the brake fluid through the lines and against the pistons and pads. Now I find that generally speaking a higher hydraulic resistance with lighter rated springs results in a more realistic feel as it adds a more consistent level of hydraulic resistance throughout the entire pedal stroke with the spring strength acting on top of it to increase the resistance as you push the pedal down further. Hydraulic dampeners can also be found on or added to your clutch or your throttle pedal as well and also add a little bit more resistance to them. But just keep in mind that if they're not adjusted properly, they can result in a bit of a delay in the pedal retracting when you lift off and can cause some strange behavior. In the case of the Fnatic V3 pedals that we mentioned just before, I personally wouldn't recommend the damper kit. I actually do have one on my pedal set, but yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it simply because it doesn't make all that much of a difference with those pedals assuming that you already have the brake performance kit included and in my opinion it's actually quite overpriced the performance benefit just really doesn't you know it doesn't add up to the extra cost involved in doing that so just something to keep in mind there as well but of course everybody's personal preference is going to vary and for me the holy grail is a brake pedal that has a decent range of movement as well as a progressive feel i find this allows for better brake pressure modulation by feeling when driving. However, some people prefer a really stiff pedal with very little physical movement. 
and just to modulate purely based off the pressure. It's really up to you guys and what you personally like to feel in a brake pedal. Moving on from the brake pedal now, another point worth mentioning is that real life clutch pedals often get lighter towards the end of their travel. When you're pushing the clutch, you can feel it kind of gets a little bit lighter towards the end, right where the friction point is. Now, many sim pedals simulate this by using a regressive spring system to allow you to adjust the effort travel and feel. For example, the HE Sprint and Ultimates both do this. The Fnatic V3s have a kind of weird system where they've got a separate lever that kind of changes the feel as it rotates through. CSL Elite, Thrustmaster and Logitech pedals, however, don't do this. Now, personally, I don't find it to be a major advantage or detractor either way, but it's just something to consider if you're looking for the most realistic driving experience. Now, just quickly, while we're on the subject of adjustment, another thing that's often overlooked is the horizontal spacing between the pedals themselves, particularly if you do a lot of heel and toe driving, this can be very important. Most cheaper pedal sets don't allow for any adjustment of the spacing between the pedals, with the exception of the CSL Elite pedals and as well the Load Cell Brake Upgrade Kit, which I reviewed a little while back. These particular pedals can be moved from side to side on the pedal plate or even be configured to only have the two pedals if you don't drive cars with a clutch. And that means that you can move the brake right over to the other side so you're not sort of having to cross your leg over if you're not using a clutch regularly. Now by comparison, the Fnatic V3 pedals do allow you to change the position of the pedal pads, but not the whole pedal. Now most higher end pedals can be individually mounted to a third party pedal plate in whatever configuration you like. So not only can you move them from side to side, but depending on your mounting solution, you could even offset them front to back should you wish to do so. I've noticed that Dave Cam in his videos has his throttle slightly offset to allow for easier right foot braking and heel and toe, something that I intend to try for myself in the future as well. I actually only noticed it just the other day and I'm definitely keen to test that out. But speaking of mounting solutions, as we discussed in the previous video, having a solid mounting solution for your pedals that won't slide around on the floor, flex or move relative to your chair is absolutely essential. So make sure that you've got this sorted first and foremost. The heavier the pedals, the more of an issue this is gonna be of course. And I've seen many cases where somebody's upgraded their pedals and they're not being able to even use them simply because their cockpit or their mounting solution wasn't up to the task. So just be aware of that. Part of the reason why sim racing could be such a money pit is because one upgrade often leads to the necessity to upgrade other components. And pedals certainly aren't an exception to this. Now it's also worth considering that you aren't gonna be driving around on a really heavy set of pedals like the HE Ultimates without some kind of racing boots or tightly fitting shoes, for example. It's also worth mentioning that inverted pedals are also a thing. With the exception of most formula style cars, most cars have at least the brake and the clutch hung from under the dash with the pivot point sitting above the pedal. Now, depending on your seating position, this can make a really significant difference. As I talked about in my how to set up correct seating position video about a week and a half ago now, you should be pushing your brake and your clutch in and out with your thigh muscles, not up and down by bending your ankle. But if your seating position is quite upright, as is often the case with sitting at a computer desk, for example, you're gonna find yourself using your ankles or stomping on the pedals. And this can make using inverted pedals really, really difficult. So just keep that in mind as well. Now, personally, I don't find inverted pedals to feel significantly different when my seating position is set up correctly and I'm using the right muscles to operate them. But I'm sure that other people will disagree. If I had the choice between a higher quality standard set of pedals or a lower quality set of inverted pedals, I would choose the better quality standard pedals every single day of the week. So the last major consideration relates to the software and ecosystem side of things. Many manufacturers such as Thrustmaster, Logitech and Fnatic all have their own ecosystems which allow you to connect all of your peripheral components such as your pedals, your shifter and your handbrake and etc all to the PC via a single USB connection. Now this has a couple of distinct advantages. Firstly, it allows you to make fine tuning adjustments to things like your braking force through a single software package. And in the case of Fnatic, for example, you can even adjust your settings on the wheel itself without having to open up any software. Now it might sound rather trivial, but it does actually make a pretty huge practical difference as it allows you to use different profiles for different sims and easily switch between them without the need to alt tab out of the game, go into different software or even recalibrate for different sims. So there's been plenty of times where I've had a spare half hour to go for a quick drive and by the time I've gotten everything set up, the moment is completely gone. I've got my wife and my kids hassling me to do something else. And you know, it just it just becomes all too hard and you end up just, just giving up. So definitely don't underestimate the practical difference that staying within one ecosystem can make if you're the sort of person that just likes to jump in for a quick drive now and again, or you know, somebody that has to fit 
in sim racing between adult responsibilities. The second advantage is in reducing the number of physical USB connections required. And this is quite important for a number of different reasons. Firstly, it's quite easy with today's hardware to overwhelm the universal serial bus on your PC and start experiencing random interruptions as a result. Plus, some older SIM titles don't play nicely with more than three or so input devices plugged in, and it can be a real hassle to get them working if they work at all. Now, I'm certainly not saying that you should pick one ecosystem and stick to it for the rest of your SIM racing career. Inevitably, at some point, you're gonna buy something that doesn't fit in within your chosen ecosystem, whether it's a button box, a motion platform, or, you know, all sorts of equipment. But I do suggest that you carefully consider which ecosystem appeals to you and how it influences your purchasing decisions to keep things as simple and practical as possible possible. It also greatly helps in reducing clutter and keeping software updates to a minimum. At the end of the day, less time stuffing around is more time driving and that's always a good thing. Now we touched on sensitivity earlier and while we're on the subject of software, this is a good time to talk about that in a little bit more detail. I mentioned earlier that if you're using a load cell that has a load rating lower than the amount of force that you're physically applying, the pedal is going to work a little bit like an on off switch unless you adapt your braking style to suit. But regardless of whether you're using a load cell, a potentiometer or a hall effect sensor, the resolution of measurement within the operating range is also very important for all three pedals. Measurement resolution is the raw data that's being used by the sim to determine how much brake pressure, throttle or clutch should be applied. So the higher the resolution, the more data the sim has to work with and the more fine tuning and modulation is possible when driving. Imagine that your throttle pedal, for example, has a 10 centimeter range of movement from fully off to fully depressed, but only 10 steps in the measurement range. This would mean that for every one centimeter that you move your foot, your throttle input in the sim actually wouldn't change at all. And then as soon as you push past the uh, thrust, the threshold of the next step, the throttle input would suddenly jump up by 10%. And this would make it almost impossible to modulate your throttle inputs. Likewise, with a load cell, the lower the number of steps in the data, the more robotic your braking is going to be in the sim. So thankfully, just about all pedals these days have a high enough resolution that this isn't really an issue anymore. But just be aware that the higher the resolution, the more modulation is theoretically possible. Again, marketing departments can get a little bit carried away here and advertise crazy high numbers as an advantage over their competitors. Personally, assuming a range of movement around five or 10 centimeters for a throttle or clutch, and maybe say zero to 150 kilos or so for a load cell, anything more than a few thousand data points seems pretty redundant to me. I'm sure that some alien driver listening will swear that they can feel the difference though. So just something to be aware of. So that just about covers everything that you need to know to make the right choice when it comes to sim racing pedals. Remember that regardless of how baller you go with your pedals, if you don't have a solid way to mount them, you're wasting your money. Heavier and more realistic feeling pedals are always going to be more difficult to operate if your seating position is incorrect. And you can imagine trying to move a 150 kilogram pedal with your ankles. So just make sure that you consider this as well. If you can't practically get into a seating position where you're able to use your thigh muscles to operate the brake and clutch, you're likely going to be pushing up and down and stomping on the pedals rather than pushing them in and out. So you might actually be better off with a cheaper set of pedals until you're ready to move up to a proper cockpit setup that allows you to get into the correct seating position. So I hope that you guys have found this video useful. If you have, please do leave a thumbs up. I know it's a lot of information to take in, but please do also feel free to hit me up with any questions in the comments below. I do read them all and respond to as many as I possibly can, as long as you're friendly and nice. And I also do welcome you to jump into our Discord community where we have over 12, actually we just hit 1300 members this morning and we're all happy to help you out with our own experience. So links above my head for the Discord community if you want to check that out. Now in the next video, we'll be taking a more detailed look at wheels and wheelbases. Then we'll be moving on to monitors, PCs, essential software and setup. So if you're not already subbed, now is a great time to do so. While you're down there, it's also worth clicking that notification bell as well so you don't miss future videos when they're released. Finally, if you're enjoying the content and looking to buy some gear and would like to help me out, I have some affiliate links in the description below as well, which don't cost you anything extra, but send a small amount of commission my way, which helps in keeping the channel going. So I really do appreciate your support there. So with all that said, happy pedal hunting. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.